the Autism Research Institute relies on the generosity of donors like you to make this webcast possible. If you enjoy this presentation, please consider making a donation. Thank you. Um, I have been looking forward to this evening ever since I first received the invitation quite a few months ago. Um, there's no group of people that are more, uh, that to me are more meaningful to talk to about this uh, critically important question of the role of environment in human health. You're it for me. And so tonight what I hope we can do is explore what we've learned at Environmental Working Group about how to pose these questions, how we've tried to break through in the policy process, and how we have tried to launch with a lot of help what we think is the most important campaign or one of the most important campaigns uh, that we've ever fought with respect to the environment, and that's the campaign to protect our health from toxic chemicals. And there are 10 people, 10 Americans, that I want to talk to you about tonight who have had a lot to do with helping us make our case. It's a very unusual group because on one day, we took a blood sample from each and every one of them and sent it to a laboratory, a series of laboratories actually, across the country in other countries around the world because that's what we needed to do. And we examined that blood for 413 different toxic chemicals. Uh, people have been studying pollution in air and water and land for decades. But this was one of the first times we ever tried to really rigorously study the broad array of pollutants in people. It hadn't been done. And of that 413 across just these 10 people, we found 287 different chemicals. 28 were waste byproducts, dioxins, furans, things that come out of tailpipes and incinerators. 47 of them were consumer product ingredients, everything from uh, the flame retardants in these projectors to the materials in my computer, pesticides, Teflon chemicals, Scotchgard chemicals, on and on. But for my money, the finding that was most shocking was that we found in these 10 people 212 industrial chemicals and pesticides that had been banned 30 years before we took those blood samples and sent them to the lab initially in 2004. So, How are they exposed, these 10 people? How do they end up with so many chemicals, an average of 200 in each one? Well, they could have been exposed through air that they breathe, but we know for a fact, even though we found some of those chemicals in these 10 Americans, that it was not as a result of any of the 650 plus pollutants that are legally admitted in the air in this country, 600 million pounds every year. We found some of those chemicals, but we know it was not the source of exposure for these 10 people. Could have been drinking water, and believe it or not, some drinking water looks like this before it's treated. The National Tap Water Database, which we collected and prepared at Environmental Working Group because there was no other source to put together drinking water tests from water utilities around the country, we found over 1,000 contaminants in water utility, drinking water, and also in groundwater across the country. But we know for a fact, even though we found many of these chemicals in those 10 Americans, that they were not exposed by virtue of the water that they drank. The Food and Drug Administration regulates over a thousand additives that migrate from food packaging into food. Some of them have hazardous properties. Many of them do, in fact. And we found some of them 
in these 10 Americans. But again, we are confident, certain, that it was not as a result of any food that they ate, that they brought home from a restaurant, cooked at home. That was not the source, even though we found these chemicals. Personal care products, women use an average of 12. Men use an average of six each and every day, according to our online survey. That exposes women, on average, to over 160 ingredients in personal care products, shampoos, mascara, makeup of all kinds, soaps. And with men, it's about half that amount. Many of them have hazardous properties, and we apply them to the largest organ we have, our skin, and they are absorbed. And we have found them in the blood of these 10 people. We found them in the blood of teenage girls. But in this case, we know for a fact that even though we found these chemicals, it wasn't as a result of personal care products that were being used by these 10 people. Just a bit of positive news, though. Our studies have definitively shown that most men use both deodorant and toothpaste. So, yes, yes. So just it's the small wins, OK? They didn't work in a place like this. They weren't farm workers or farmers. That's not how they came by the pesticides that we found in their blood, including pesticides that had been banned decades before. So 10 Americans, 287 chemicals across the 10, an average of 200 in each one. Who were they? How were they exposed? Well, the truth of the matter is, we don't really know very much about these 10 people. About the only thing we know for sure is that when they were exposed, all of them looked something like this. Our study was the first time that anyone had ever bothered to look to see how many different toxic industrial chemicals are found in umbilical cord blood. This was a study we did in conjunction with the American Red Cross. Their research program, when we applied, immediately accepted it because they felt that it was so novel and actually so rather absurd. Now, at ARI, you're used to taking on big things, so this is not news to you. Sometimes it takes the, the smallest but most determined organization and group of people to get something done, and the Red Cross saw that in us. And so we were able to study this pollution in people for the first time in umbilical cord blood. And the results were, to say the least, disconcerting. Here's another view more modern technology. You can see this little guy. He's well along. He's pretty near full term. You can see him smile, moving around in there. He doesn't have much room to move around at this point. And a couple things about this, this baby. We know that, like all babies, he's receiving, along with the oxygen and the the nutrition in the blood that circulates to him from his mother, we know that he's receiving some dose of toxic chemicals. Another thing we know is that at this stage in a baby's life, there is no blood-brain barrier, which will develop and just begin developing in a matter of months after birth, that can block toxic chemicals from reaching directly into the cells of the brain. The other thing we know about this particular baby is this is my baby. This is Callahan Cook. There he is, not long after he was born, with his mom. He used to smile a lot in his sleep. Now he just smiles all the time, but sleeps less. And um, she had him two days after her 50th birthday. So there's a bit of science and a bit of miracle involved. I see a thumb up back there. Yes, ma'am. And the reason I introduce 
Cal into this is to let you know how personal this is for me, that our experiment, our study, showed that even though Cal wasn't a member of the cohort, he was born after we did the study, that we've, uh, we've all, who have had children, we have all been rolling the dice at some level with these chemicals that we know are in the blood. Of course, the mothers were exposed. All of us are exposed. And in most cases, the mothers were simply going about ordinary life, doing nothing extraordinary but eating and drinking and so forth. And we have found the profiles similar to this in other cohorts of Americans that we have studied. There he is with this characteristic, respectful look at dad. Industrial pollution is not a phenomena of distant smokestacks or distant water pipes. Industrial pollution begins in the womb. And when we looked at the properties of these chemicals, it was reason to be especially concerned. 134 of those 287 have been shown to cause cancer in laboratory animals and some in humans. Some are known human carcinogens. 151 linked to birth defects. Hormone disruption, 154 of them. Now if you're doing a little math, you've already figured out that we have more effects than we have chemicals. Why? Because some of these chemicals have multiple effects. And this doesn't count something that we right now don't have the scientific foundation for counting in a, any kind of sophisticated way. This doesn't count the effects that might result from combinations of chemicals. This is just one chemical at a time tabulating the health endpoints. Infertility, another 186 had that property. Immune system toxicity, 130 had the capability to do that. And then, of course, the neurotoxins, lead, mercury, PCBs, flame retardants. The list goes on and on and on for neurotoxins. And my friend Phil Landrigan and a colleague named Dr. Grandjean published in The Lancet some years ago a survey, meta-study, meta-analysis of neurodevelopmental toxins. And they said, the combined evidence suggests that neurodevelopmental disorders caused by industrial chemicals have created a silent pandemic in modern society. That these exposures mean something. Now my my friends in the chemical industry, in the pesticide industry, my worthy opponents, often point out when they look at the results of our study that, you know, you just, most of those chemicals that you found were in the part per billion range. Very low doses. Very low doses. And it's an important talking point for them because they know that when they say a part per billion, most people assume the dose is too low to matter. Well, let's. Let's explore that because it's one of the most important issues for all of us to push through. A part per billion, and this is a metaphor used by the chemical industry, is equivalent to one pancake in a stack of pancakes 4,000 miles high. They actually, the chemical industry actually stacked pancakes and took a photograph of it just to make the point, which, and they shared the, the image with us, and I just, I want to, I want to thank them for for doing that, they have so much money, it was, it was not a big deal. One pancake in a stack of pancakes 4,000 miles high. Now what could possibly have biological meaning at such a minuscule concentration? I mean, are these doses too low to matter? Even if you add up all the chemicals, even if there are synergistic effects, if it's a few parts per billion, 20, 30, 40 parts per billion, even less than a part per billion? Is there anything that really has effects at that level? Well, for most of the chemicals we found in those 10 babies, 
we haven't done the studies to really understand if those low doses matter. There's really only one category of chemicals where we have that kind of detailed knowledge. And the reason we have that detailed knowledge is because the studies are required before these chemicals can come to market. We call these chemicals drugs. Albuterol is in the desk of every school teacher and certainly every school nurse in the country because one spray of it can almost instantly st stop most asthma attacks un until the, the child has become resistant to the drug. And 2.1 parts per billion is the topical level that's left when this is applied. So 2.1 parts per billion active ingredient can stop an asthma attack. That's a, that suggests that parts per billion might make a biological difference, huh? Let's look at some others. Paxil, common antidepressant. One dose in your bloodstream, the therapeutic dose, leaves 30 parts per billion. Cialis, used to treat erectile dysfunction, can have profound therapeutic impacts. 30 parts per billion is the dose in the male blood. And as I say, we all know that uh, Cialis is very potent. How about Nuvarin, one of the most popular birth control agents on the market? It is effective at 0 0.035 parts per billion. And we know this because of animal and human clinical trials for all of these drugs that are required by the Food and Drug Administration before they come on the market. Now, not only do we study their clinical effects at various doses, we also know a lot about what would be called health effects in the context of toxic chemicals but are called side effects when it comes to drugs. And um, here's one for, to go back to Cialis, uh, which, uh, by the way, if a playful moment turns into the right moment, you can be ready over a 48-hour period or so. So the first health effect that affects some people, and they have to say this, I know we're all adults here, at least I think we are, um, so you've all you have all seen this on television, but the reason you have is because they're required to say what the health effects are before they can sell it and advertise it. So if you have any sudden decrease in hearing or vision at 30 parts per billion, in addition to the therapeutic effect, stop taking Cialis and seek immediate medical help. You can't see or hear at 30 parts per billion. You ought to seek immediate medical help. And then, of course, there's the most notorious side effect of all. <clears throat> At 30 parts per billion. And you know, the question I have about this side effect is if you've also experienced the preceding side effect and you can't see or hear, how do you make the call? Low doses matter, and we know that when we study them. And don't let any representative or talking point or website tell you otherwise about environmental toxicants unless you can be assured by independent experts and scientists that they have looked to see if there can be effects at low levels, if they've done rigorous studies to check it out first. And most of the chemicals that we found in those babies had no such studies conducted on them before they came to market. If they had been drugs, they would not have been allowed on the market, and we found them in babies. In some cases, we found them in babies, neurotoxins in babies, just to get right to the point, chemicals that had been banned 
30 years before, but were so persistent in the environment, lasted so long, in some cases built up in animal tissue, human tissue, that they were still there even though we, we banned them. So let's review. Low doses matter. Remember this. For 30 parts per billion, you can inspire human reproduction. For 0.035 parts per billion, you can prevent it. And then for another 30 billion, you can just chill out either way. <laughs> of the top 200 drugs on the market as of two years ago, when we looked through, 13% listed serious side effects at, less, at concentrations of less than 100 parts per billion. But here's the thing. It's one thing to know that about drugs. What about toxic chemicals, right? And if they experience toxic chemical effects, they can't call their doctor. And that, my friends, is why we're here tonight. So why do we care? What's, what's the big deal? We care because there are health effects in the population across a wide range of illnesses, diseases, and disorders that we cannot explain by genetics alone. Increases in health endpoints, health problems that don't happen because we're evolving that quickly because evolution doesn't work that way. What scientists who are worth their weight in the scientific community that's concerned about toxicology now all are agreeing is that the most important area of study is not a nature versus nurture framework. It's the question that we have to ask about what might happen when someone who has a specific genetic profile and perhaps a genetic vulnerability or susceptibility encounters a toxic chemical exposure or another agent that might trigger the expression of a gene that might lead to an adverse health endpoint. It may just lead to a very temporary change or it could lead to something more profound. It's the combination of what we bring to the party genetically and the environment that we're exposed to that makes the difference. And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Now, we care because 7.3 million American couples have trouble becoming pregnant or caring to full term. And this is a 20% a increase in the last decade. This infertility is considered to be, to have an, an important environmental dimension. Decreased sperm count in men, likewise, considered to be an important chemical component. Is there anyone here who does not have a friend or a loved one, someone, that, someone they know, who has had breast cancer? No. One in eight in the population. One in three women we know will develop cancer, one in two men during their lifetimes. And we know that from migration studies that when people move from a place with a lower incidence of cancers to the United States, their cancer profiles begin to resemble within a generation, in this particular study of Japanese immigrants to the United States, within a generation, they begin to approach the level of cancer in the US population. What's going on? It's a combination of what we bring to the party genetically and what we're exposed to. So what are those things? And which ones should we focus on? That's the great mystery. And then there's kids. 80%, 84% increase in acute lymphocytic leukemia in children over that interval. Hypospadias, a birth defect of boys, where the tip of the urethra comes out not at the end of the penis, but somewhere along the shaft and requires surgery in infancy to fix. It's doubled. It's now approaching 1% of baby boys. And chemicals are strongly implicated. A 57% increase in childhood brain cancer. 
Now, I have been in debates where people from the chemical industry have suggested that, and you've heard stories like this before in the, in the case of the autism spectrum, that it's better diagnosis. We'll touch on that presently. But what pediatricians tell me who were working in the early 1970s, and these are st some of the top pediatricians still in the country, they say that if a kid in 1975 had brain cancer, you knew it. This is not a diagnosis that you would miss. You might get it too late, but if it was brain cancer, it was noted. The reason there's a 57% increase in childhood brain cancer is because there's a 57% increase, increase in childhood brain cancer. Breast development by race. This is the age at which girls, young girls coming into the doctor's office begin to, to show, begin to present breasts. There's a graph for white girls. And here's the graph. Of course, fewer data points because of what we know have been the, the, the structured, structural racism within the medical profession for studying minority patients. But look at that trend line. Is it food? Is it something in the food? Is it something environmental at all? Well, no one knows, we just know. And if you talk to any pediatrician and ask them, are, are girls coming into your office now starting puberty earlier? Are they menstruating earlier? Are they, having, are they showing breasts, presenting breasts in a, in a physical examination earlier? And they will all say yes, and they don't know what the hell is going on, but they're seeing it. Asthma. When I was growing up, which was a while ago, it, okay, it was in the 1950s and 60s. When I was growing up, I didn't know anybody who had asthma. Did you? Somebody, right? Yeah? One in 10. In some cities in the United States, it's one in 12 or 14 kids with asthma. And the more they exercise in bad air, the more they're exposed to asthmagens at home and cleaning products and uh, dust that comes off of, of consumer products the higher the incidence. This is not evolution. And neither is this. When I first started giving this lecture, not so many years ago it seems, this number said one in 150, remember? Remember? And it's, it's the great mystery, but there is less mystery now than there was at the founding, a lot less of ARI, but we need to do a lot more to make it even less mysterious, to understand exactly what it is in the environment that might be contributing to this shocking, tragic number and the lives behind it, the families behind it. So what's going on? This is a research report, a publication that came out a, a few years ago entitled Occam's Razor and Autism, the Case for Developmental Neurotoxins Contributing to a Disease of Neurodevelopment by Catherine DeSoto in Neurotoxicity. The reason for the rise in ASD diagnoses likely involves genetically predisposed individuals being exposed to various environmental triggers at higher rates of exposure than in past generations. It might be argued that if environmental contact with neurotoxins increases the odds of autism, then the increase in AST diagnoses over the past generation can be explained by a macro level increase, a global, a large scale increase in such toxins. And that is exactly what has taken place. Here's a study that was published in 2009 and written up by my friend Marla Cohn for Scientific American. That's the headline. 
Research links soaring incidence of the mysterious neurological disorder to fetal and infant exposure to pesticides, viruses, and household chemicals. Excuse me? These are exposures we can prevent, if that's a factor. We can dramatically slash them. I'll show you how we can do that in just a moment. In this same, uh, another study, um, Actually, this is the same study. So they, they were looking over the period 1990 through 2006 in California. They were look at, looking at uh, autism rates. A 600 to 700% increase in diagnosed ASD cases. Six or 700%. Then they went through and tried to cor you know, correct for what might have been contributors to that that weren't really artifacts of an environmental interaction. They could eliminate about 24% from earlier diagnosis, diagnosing children when they were at an earlier age, 56% from the broadening of the spectrum and diagnoses along it. Okay, good to identify those, but 120% in state reporting of what they did find, but nowhere close to explaining the 600 to 700% increase, nowhere close. And as Bernie Weiss, distinguished neuroscientist, pointed out in commenting on this article, that basically said a good chunk of this is environmental and the interaction between the environment and people who are predisposed perhaps or susceptible to ASD because of a, their genetic makeup, but then they're exposed to a toxin that triggers it or makes it worse. Excessive emphasis has been placed on genetics as a cause, he said. It sounds like that the interview we heard at the top of the show from a brilliant leader in the 1960s. So, the advances in molecular genetics have tended to obscure the principle that genes are always acting in and on a particular environment and the people within it, he might have added. So, what do we do? There are two dimensions to this. And the first one is what we can do personally, which is we can take steps to reduce exposures. Now, we all live in the real world. There are some exposures that are going to happen Regardless of our best effort, would you like to see that again? You would, wouldn't you? Yes, yeah, aren't you ashamed? It's, it, thank, thank goodness it's late and there's no one else here. Okay, I'll show it to you again. Yeah. And I, I know what you're concerned about, so I just want to allay any, any such concerns uh, right now. Uh, no dog was in, injured in the making of this video. Okay, so don't, don't get upset. Look, um, we're not suggesting that we ought to assume that avoiding every exposure or every uh, episode in modern life that might lead to an exposure that might be harmful is the way we should be ordering our days. But it turns out we can do an awful lot to dramatic redu dramatically reduce exposures if we take some simple steps and look at some of the main pathways, food, water, personal care products, and so forth. So here's our to-do list, just for starters. Buy organic. Avoid those neurotoxic insecticides and fungicides. Eat low mercury fish. We have lists on our website. There are plenty of places to go where you can see fish that tends to be lower in mercury because it tends to be a little lower on the food chain, doesn't eat other fish, and accumulate in the, in the flesh. Filter your tap water. Find out what's in it. You can use the National Tap Water Database. We'll be updating it sometime in the next few months. You can go to your local water utilities website, see what's in your drinking water, and you can find a filter to match it. And we urge you, even, even countertop filters for some things like lead, an important neurotoxin, can be very helpful, can really knock the levels down and inexpensively. We recommend using stainless steel instead of nonstick. Um, there are some nonstick 
uh, products out there that we think might be better than the ones that came with from uh, the perfluorochemicals with them, the, the sort of Scotchgard Teflon family. But still, we, we recommend for the most part use, use stainless if you're cooking. If you, go, if, you Google, if you Google pet birds and Teflon, you will come to an environmental working group website where we did a study that review, simply reviewed the literature and then went out to the public and asked them, have you ever had a pet bird killed by overheating a nonstick pan? And of course, thousands and thousands of people wrote in and said, yes, that happened. And, they, and the birds die within a matter of minutes if there's enough of it in the air. Did you not know that? Yeah, just comes off, all kinds of particles. And then be smart when you shop for personal care products. Try and use ones and use them in your family that don't have hazardous ingredients. You can go to our website at Skin Deep. We publish everyday pollution solutions all the time. They're all aimed not so much at an environmental impact. That's important, but we have specialized in looking at human health hazards. Our Skin Deep database, over 70,000 products. We're overhauling it right now. Uh, that, that goes through, it. if you, if you want to find out which ones have neurotoxins in it, you can select for that. You can look for the ones that are, might be uh, known to be carcinogenic. And again, we're not saying that we don't know much about exposure levels. It's hard to do a, a risk assessment, the kind of thing we like to do for pesticides when we can. It's hard to do it in the case of personal care products and also cleaning products because we don't really have very much exposure data. And the companies aren't required to provide it to the agency because, by and large, uh, personal care products, you can put almost anything in them. If I told you how personal care product ingredients were regulated, I know you wouldn't believe me. So someone asked me that question after, afterwards, and I'll, and I'll manage to work it in. And then we use thousands of ingredients linked to all these toxicity databases to reach, to reach our conclusion about the hazards. And that's actually an out-of-date uh, search number, we probably get six or seven, eight million searches a month on that database. And again, in these 16 unique uh, 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 products every day, that should read products, not, these are the kinds of chemicals that are in there. Cleaning products. The first study we did of these was a glove box study of 21 school cleaners. We just put them in and used them as directed, cleaning glass, scrubbing countertops, and so forth. And we found across them 450 different chemicals in air. A lot of them were ab asthmogens. A number of them were neurotoxins. So if you're in a school setting, try and get them to make sure they use certified green cleaners. They tend to be safer. Not always, but they tend to be safer. And then if you want to help pitch in at your, in, in a school setting and help them make things cleaner and greener, ask them what they're using, get the ingredients, let us know at EWG and we'll tell you what we think. Or for cleaning products you buy and use at home, go to our guide to health cleaning. We just started it in September, just went online. Something like 2,200 cleaning products window washers, multi-purpose cleaners, dishwashing detergents, laundry detergents, and so forth. Look yours up. Look for the, the ones that we rate as less hazardous, hazardous. But we can't shop our way out. I mean, when we had our little guy in the months during the time when my wife was pregnant, and then ever since, I drive myself crazy looking at these websites. And they're my websites. I can imagine how you all feel. But, you know, we've got other things we need to be doing, right? Other than spending all this time seeing if products that we are, can freely buy in a store have hazardous chemicals in them. Where is the government? Where is the government? Well, we need to get them involved. And the reason they're not is because of this law, the Toxic Substances Control Act of 1976, the only major environmental statute that has never been updated and modernized since it was first written and signed into law, may he rest in peace, 
by Gerald Ford. Okay? Here's what this law did. 30 year, years ago plus, never updated, 62,000 chemicals were grandfathered in and presumed safe because EPA announced and was told by the Congress, well, you'll, you'll just go back and review those and make sure they're okay, but we're going to grandfather them in now. We're not going to interrupt commerce in toxic chemicals at this point. Just, just get busy and evaluate them. And it does not require health and safety studies of industrial chemicals, toxic industrial chemicals, before they come into the marketplace. We require these kinds of studies, even though we quibble with how rigorous they are sometimes and how uh, broad they are. Are they capturing all the adverse potential health effects? But we, we do have such a, a system in place for pesticides. But if it's a chemical ingredient that goes in a baby rattle or a chemical ingredient that goes in a, the liner of a crib, there's no health and safety standard. We think they should be at least as safe as pesticides. 80% of all new chemicals that come to EPA are approved within three weeks. Okay? And in the whole history of this law, only five chemicals have been banned or restricted by EPA. Only about 200 really have rigorously been studied of that 60,000. But five banned. This, this law is so weak that when the first Bush administration, Bush the elder, tried to use it to ban asbestos, for which we know there are signature definitive health endpoints, fatal health endpoints like mesothelioma, the industry challenged it in court and won. So this law was so weak, the standards that protected industry were so generous, the Bush administration was unable to ban asbestos. And it's still used in a lot of products in this country. So we need to fix this law, and I'm just going to make a very brief pitch. There's a lot of work that's been underway for some years in Washington. Here are the principles that we think ought to be embodied in fixing the Toxic Substances Control Act. Chemicals ought to be safe for children and for sensitive populations before they're allowed on the market. We ought to make sure that the companies prove the chemicals are safe instead of the current system where EPA has to try and prove with very limited information that the chemicals are causing harm. And when you can't prove to the satisfaction of the Supreme Court, which is where the asbestos case went, that asbestos causes harm, you're unlikely to be able to approve, prove that lesser chemical agents are causing health problems. So reverse that. Require health and safety studies before chemicals come onto the market. And if there's going to be safety reviews or bans or phase out of any chemicals, let's, let's start with the chemicals we're finding in people. Let's start with that list. And you know the 200 plus chemicals that we found in those 10 babies? That's because we spent $10,000 per sample at the lab. If we had the lab capabilities today, if we spent $20,000 per sample, how many would we find in babies still in the womb? Would it be 400, 600, 800? Are babies born with 1,000 industrial chemicals and insecticides and pesticides in their blood? I don't know. It is not implausible. So let's look and see what's in blood and work back from there because then there's no question that there's been exposure. We might have questions about the route of exposure, but we know the stuff is in us. The next step is to ask ourselves, to have scientists who are independent and impartial ask, is it possibly causing harm? And what's our best way to be assured, if it's going to be in babies or anybody else, that it's not? And then we think that chemicals in cord blood, the presumption should be they're unsafe if they're, if they're the most vulnerable stage of life, one of the most vulnerable stages, we ought to make sure that we do extra rigorous study, an expedited study of any chemicals that are going to end up there. And this is where you can find out what we're doing to make this law and others like it a reality in a very tough political environment in Washington. Now, this is my close, 
And my close is to tell you that even though that sounds like it's common sense, it's a big fight with the chemical industry, as you might imagine. But we've had these big fights before and we've won. We've changed the way the public thinks about major public health issues. This looks silly now, but at the time it was, it was published and there are lots of ads around like this. No one was willing to believe that tobacco really was a health threat and some courageous researchers were able to demonstrate sufficiently to the Surgeon General that the revolution in dealing with tobacco began, and it's, it's far from over. But what I want to tell you today is that when we've taken steps to deal with environmental pollution, we have cleaned up air, the levels in air have gone down, we still have problems, but they're down, drinking water, surface water, landfills, they're all cleaner than they were a generation ago because there was an effort to regulate them. But we've done more than clean up the environment. We've cleaned up our blood when we've put our minds to it. We took the lead out of gasoline and blood lead levels in people plummeted. We still have really significant concerns about even average levels of lead in kids. And, we're, and there's a, a new concern backed up by new recommendations for a, an even lower tolerance for the level in lead that is considered safe. The more we study a lot of these chemicals over the years, the lower the levels go that we think officially are safe. Lead's a good example. So even though we still have problems, we've come a long way. PCB, this was the chemical Monsanto produced that was used throughout the electrical grid. It's all over the environment now. We found it in those babies. When Monsanto was confronted with the prevalence of PCBs first found in wildlife and then later in human blood, their first reaction, their first talking point was, well, we can get rid of PCBs, but then we won't have electricity. We just can't have Well, it turned out that with some pressure and some ingenuity, we did ban PCBs. The lights are still on, and PCB blood levels plummeted. But again, we found this in babies. This was, you see when it was banned? 1976. Actually, that's about the only thing the Toxic Substances Control Act did. It ratified the, the ban that Monsanto had already accepted. The levels plummeted. And the same with DDT. Comes onto the market, there's one point of blood testing, it's banned, thanks to Rachel Carson, and we celebrate her, the 50th anniversary of Silent Spring, of course, just last month. Thanks to her, blood lead levels of DDT in our population have plummeted. And we still found breakdown products of DDT in the babies we tested in 2004. So if, you've, if there's a chemical that's toxic, it lasts in the environment and it builds up in people and there are lots of them still out there. We don't want to waste any time getting them off the market and finding a safer substitute. So we can do this. We've done it before. And this is my final slide. This is my little guy, Callahan Cook, experiencing, not really seeing because he's so young, but experiencing his first thunderstorm on the front porch of our house about 10 days after he was born. And when I look at that little face, and I've watched it grow, when I look at that little face, I see his whole future ahead of him, as I imagine it. A future where he's, he's healthy, he's exploring, the sense of wonderment that life brings him, the dreams, the imagination, all of that I see in this photograph. And if there's any substance out there, any chemical, any pollution that is going to interfere with the future I see on that little face, we have to do something about it. 
We have to do something about it personally as best we can in the way we go about our daily affairs, the way we shop, what we shop for. And we have to hold Washington and where need be state governments accountable to do something too. Because we have better things to do than go to environmental working group websites all day long and find out what's safe. The government should be doing that. And so I ask you, and we will certainly do our part when it comes to research on autism to make this happen, make a thunderstorm roll into Washington and make Washington pay attention to his future and everyone's future that might be compromised by the toxic chemicals that are all around us and in every one of us. Thank you. The Autism Research Institute relies on the generosity of donors like you to make this webcast possible. If you enjoy this presentation, please consider making a donation. Thank you.